The reality is that like there's seven billion people in the world and there's like I don't know, not that many millions of people interacting on chain. So our mission at the moment is just like find new ways to grow and find high quality users and bring them in and get them started for free and then let them kind of like fire their way into becoming like a higher quality retained user. All right, everyone, before we get into the episode today, I want to talk a bit about Access Protocol. They're built on Solana and solving the subscription problem in a crypto native way. We'll talk more about them later in the show. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. We are joined today by Vibhu, the founder of Drip, and this is a second appearance on the episode. Uh, you joined us about six months ago and really had a great conversation around all of the work you guys are doing on building a consumer application on Solana. Um, but I want to, I would definitely recommend to the audience to kind of go back and listen to that to get a ground zero on what Drip is and what they're doing. Um, but for those who won't, I, I do want to give a, a quick high level overview of the product you guys are building and the problem you're aiming to solve. If you could just kick us off there, Bibu. Sure. So Drip is a kind of first of its kind platform where people can earn free collectibles from creators, people that make art, music, videos, um, brands, and other games. Um, we kind of think of ourselves as, kind of uh, taking Instagram and Patreon and mixing it with digital ownership. And uh, it's been a really, really fun and exciting product for many, many people that are um, in Solana, but also coming from from outside of Solana. And why why did you choose to create this mix of different platforms? What problem did you see that was present in the markets or the experience today that you were like, no, something different needs to exist? What is the problem? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, there's a whole bunch. Um, I think I would probably start with saying that creators don't get paid on the internet today. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, some of our greatest platforms, YouTube, Instagram, um, and so on, basically made the decision a long time ago. They didn't need to pay anybody for the content that they made. Um, they could run advertising on top of it. Only about the top 1% or less of creators are actually making, um, you know, real income from these things that they're contributing to. Um, second of all, um, the internet's user experience has gotten worse and worse every single year of my life. Um, it's been overrun by paywalls, been overrun by subscriptions. Um, who doesn't have the problem where they have 20 different $15 subscriptions a month? They have no idea what they're paying for. Um, you know, this is, these are things that, uh, there's ads everywhere. It's uh, rampant. You can't, I mean, someone sends you a link to an article that you want to read and then, you read the first par- paragraph, you start scrolling, and there, boom, there's a paywall. You've got to pay a dollar to unlock it or whatever. Um, we just have, um, we have, we've gotten to a place where I think the internet has just become disappointing. The content creators are frustrated. Um, and yeah, we kind of walked ourselves into it with, with Drip. I think crypto has the primitives to, um, to really change the game. Can you be a bit more specific? Like, why would Drip and tokenizing content, in a sense, help with those problems and maybe which problems do they help with the most specifically? Yeah. So my belief is that the reason that the internet's user experience has gotten so bad is um, actually because of the missing micropayments model. I think we have um, put ourselves in a situation where um, everything has a very artificial um, barrier on top of it, right? If you want to buy a single piece of content today, um, you can't really buy it for anything less than, a couple of dollars and the margins with the credit card fees and all that kind of stuff start to not make that much sense. Um, and so what has kind of happened with the internet is that we have uh, most content experiences are, are being aggregated in some way where they're bundling, um, you know, lots of things that you don't want to listen to on Spotify with things that you do want to listen to, but you kind of pay for all of it, regardless of what you do or don't listen to right in that particular context. And you kind of see that same model happen all over the place. Um, what crypto and what Solana specifically allows us to do is to pay um, creators at the smallest fractions of a cent um, very efficiently. When someone subscribes to a creator on Drip, they're effectively paying something like four cents per month on average. So now all of a sudden, you know, instead of you know being able to spend ten dollars a month on one subscription, you can subscribe to hundreds of creators for that same um, amount of money, and it's much more direct. The content creator is receiving that directly from the end 
um, consumer of it. Um, I also believe that uh, you know the, the crypto provides some really interesting mechanics for distributing content directly from the creator over to um, the user that is receiving it. Um, and this has this property of allowing a creator to kind of own their audience in a way that they don't in Web2. Um, simply because the creator is delivering these their content directly to the end person, um, all that data lives on chain um, on Solana itself. And so uh, should the creator become uninterested in working with Drip or Drip shuts down or something like that, um, the content still lives forever. Um, and, the, and the creator themselves can take their audience somewhere else. So um, yeah, I think from provenance and from payments, um, you know, that's, those are kind of the two angles that, that we think a lot about. So you mentioned that the, the, uh, just the upgrade of an experience for creators largely, right. Is the fact that you can kind of get paid for your work and the ad based model of web two doesn't tend to, uh, efficiently distribute that to, you know, anyone outside of the top 1%. And so I kind of think there'd be a, you know, spinning drip up from ground zero. There'd be this like chicken or the egg problem, right? Like creators want to build for users, but users aren't going to come to a platform with no creators. And so how has that experience been uh, throughout Drip's existence? And and which side is, are you finding is harder to kind of create the uh, the initial inertia for? Well, at this point, we don't have any problems because we've kind of uh, been able to crack that nut. Um, in the very beginning, it was very hard to recruit creators to the platform. Um, you know, I think what we were doing from the crypto side of things, like, was very uncomfortable, right? There, we were, we were kind of entering a world where a lot of artists uh, were producing very, very scarce pieces, right? One of one's editions of 25 or 100. And what we were proposing was that they stop thinking about scarcity as the primary um, thing, but instead think about the distribution mechanism um, as the most important um, part of what they were doing on chain. And um, to be honest, for a really long time, uh, most creators uh, dismissed the model, didn't want to do it. Uh, but we were really lucky to have the ultimate chicken, which was uh, Gen Poet. Um, he's laying a thousand golden eggs right now for creators. Like he took um, a, a huge risk to move his business over to Drip when there was no monetization, there was no, there's really nothing going on. And he was a creator who, previous to us, made millions of dollars with his on chain art. Um, so it was a pretty big deal for him to take that leap. And since then, we've kind of just, um, you know, as we've expanded the product, made it better, um, you know, we've been able to like start to tap into a wider and wider crew there. Um, I never, you know, worry about the collector side, to be honest. Like, I think we're kind of in the business of giving people, um, you know, free, free gifts, free things that are tradable that can, that can make the money. Um, so like that, like everyone, um, everyone likes content. Um, everyone likes um, getting free stuff. So um, to date, that's kind of like not the not my focus. It's really like enabling creators that understand this medium and you know can build a business around collectibles around themselves. One thing I've noticed is a lot of people are now trying to maybe follow similar models, right? Uh, kind of creating a curated channel for content in a sense, but with crypto reels and sometimes they might do it in more focused ways, like maybe just written content. And obviously, you know, like things like Instagram are just pictures at first. TikTok was just videos. Uh, but I, I noticed that Drip is very specifically just content, which is kind of a general umbrella. Uh, so I have to, two questions for that. Uh, one is, first, how do you just think about the competition that has risen up? And then two, do you think... Like, what do you think about content just being very, very general and abstract in drip sense versus something more focused, like a like a mirror.xyz, where it's just very opinionated? Yeah, uh, those are good questions. Those are things that we ask ourselves a lot, too. Um, you know, one of my, um, one of the things that I don't like about um, kind of Web2 social media is that it's evolved to be very... Um, it's a, it's, a, it's, a situ, it's a situation where if you're like a musician, for example, today in Web2, you are publishing your, um, you know, your music in 10 different places. You're posting behind the scenes and, you know, advertisements on Instagram. You're making YouTube videos. Um, you're now doing TikTok stuff. You kind of um, end up having to build an audience like 20 times over. And the reason that that's the case is because there's no portability of audience, right? If you're, even if you're the biggest creator in the world and you built, 
um, an audience on Twitch like Ninja did, you know, four or five years ago uh, when he was the biggest creator in, in, in uh, esports. Um, you know, uh, Microsoft signed him to a deal to go and stream at Mixer and like his audience can come with him, right? Like you can do uh, as much marketing as you want as a creator. You can be as big as you want. But um, the fact is like getting someone to move from one place that they enjoy content to somewhere else is very difficult. So I feel like Web2 kind of evolved around content mediums instead of creators themselves. Um, that doesn't really make that much sense on chain, right? Because you really, like your audience lives on chain. It's kind of yours to, to own. Um, and so when you build around the creator, you realize that like a musician is making videos or making songs or making art, they're making all kinds of stuff around themselves. Why shouldn't that live um, in a single place around and inside of their subscribers, you know, wallets in this case. So I, I personally think that's what creators want out of it. Um, that being said, I think, you know, where drip is kind of weak is that, you know, we are trying to build an experience that's kind of best for everything, but it may not be, um, the best for any specific niche. So, um, if I were thinking about competing with drip, um, as another founder, I might carve out specific areas and really dive, in, dive into music or videos or art or things that we're probably never going to service, like, you know, to the highest degree, because we're trying to build something that, that works for everybody. All right, quick break from the episode here to talk to you about Access Protocol, the easiest and best way to stay updated on what's happening in crypto by following your favorite publishers. You can gain access to over 60 publishers, including CoinGecko, Crypto Slate, and a whole list of independent creators. Most importantly, you can also do this without managing a bunch of different subscriptions. We all know how painful that can be. So how it works is you find your favorite publishers, you stake the ACS token, that's the access token, and once you stake, you gain access to all of that creator's content without the hassle of ads or subscriptions that you can't cancel or lose track of how many you have. Access Protocol already has over 225,000 users that are finding new creators, reading content, and even receiving NFTs from their favorite creators. They're soon releasing V2, so check it out, the link in the description to go give the protocol a try. It's an awesome product, it's crypto native, and it's built on Solana. When you think about the user experience side, that's been a long-standing crypto pain point, right? Where you have to have a wallet, and if you're already not an on-chain user, like that is a very uncomfortable experience. Even with how far wallets have come over the past, you know, six to twelve months, you know, you still have to have this like awkward web app uh, that's injected into your browser and have this clunky seed phrase. And how do you think about that? when you think about expanding beyond just like this initial world of on-chain users today, like, is that this weird barrier to entry that, you know, every application is going to have to overcome? Or do you think people will just end up becoming comfortable with like the crypto UX that's just needed, right? You just have to use this phantom wallet. I, I mean, I've written many times that I think that the current wallet experience is just really difficult for people that are new. The most common thing that happens, I hear this all the time. I mean, literally every day. Um, because Drip is an entry point for so many people that are new to crypto, um, they'll DM us and tell us their wallet was drained or whatever that they set up just for Drip, right? People, um, wallets today don't really protect users at all from self-custody. Self-custody is an advanced concept to me. It's something that, um, imagine like, I don't know, like you have your like trad bank account and someone else could get it if they simply um, tricked you into like connecting to it. Um, and you had no recourse. I mean, it's really, it's a really, um, it's a really, really tough situation for, um, for people that are not technical at all. I mean, obviously it's gotten better, but I still don't think it's ideal. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we are, um, I think it's one of the big challenges that we need to solve and we're, you know, going to be fixing that with our mobile app, uh, which comes out in like April, May ish timeframe, uh, that ships with an embedded wall inside of it. So your experience of signing up for Drip will be the same as you know signing up for Facebook or anything like that. You sign up for email. Um, that being said, um, there's no avoiding self custody, and and I think uh, you know one of the beautiful things about on chain content is that it's composable. You can trade it in Tensor. You can um, play these like you know burn games that other people have made. There's all kinds of utilities that have been built around Drip. And an embedded wall doesn't really do the job. So how we think about it is land everybody with two wallets. So you're, as you're as, when you're a beginner, you get the embedded wall. You kind of have that base experience where like we're protecting you um, as much as possible. But in your settings, you know you'll select like an advanced thing that says like I understand the self custody wall. I know how to keep my assets safe. Um, let me connect this here. You check the box. Now the connect to phantom button will appear, and you kind of create a link between those two things. 
But what we're planning to do is to have both of them running at the same time. So um, by default, everything drops into your um, your drip wallet, but um, you'll be able to gaslessly take those assets out of that wallet and, and move them to your fan. We'll pay for it um, if you want. Kind of want to access that advanced utility. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a spectrum, right? I think this kind of thing makes like the decentralization people very um, concerned because now we are kind of like um, in this moment of time, like in control of those assets. Um, but you know, we really we feel like it's more important to protect the new people than it is to um, satisfy the people that are already here. Because the reality is that like there's seven billion people in the world, and there's like I don't know, not that many millions of people interacting on chain. So uh, we kind of have to solve that problem first before we, um, you know, let them um, let them let them on their own. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I feel like a lot of the self custody maximalism, if you will, just kind of spurred out of the ideas of, of you know, crypto's origin story coming from Bitcoin uh, and being that kind of like new form of a currency. Um, but when we fast forward, you know, many years later to today, consumer apps were never part of the, the Bitcoin equation back in the day, right? And, and now we're trying to build things for everyday people. And even if you think about DeFi, it still feels uncomfortable that, you know, you could have your, you, you mentioned your banking account and just you just plug that into an application and, you know, maybe I approve some contract and I wake up and I have no money left and there's, there's no, there's no takesy backsies. It's, it's done and over with. So I mean, I feel this every time I open my wallet and I see how much I have in there, I'm thinking, Oh my God, I cannot believe this is just sitting in like a one pass for private key or like seed phrase somewhere. Right. It's, it's really, it's really scary. It's really terrifying. I don't know how to fix that, but I do think I, what to your point, like um, sovereignty is like, a fun foundational um, piece of crypto and why it's um, and why it exists. Um, at the same time, like I think we've discovered other things about crypto that are very useful, which includes like provenance, which includes like you know um, identity and payments. Like there's lots of things that um, crypto has unlocked that um, you know I think the user's uh, experience of that doesn't have to rotate around um, um, understanding how how the security model works. Um, but again, I think, you know, users should have that opportunity if they want it. Um, I'm not about sort of like, I want to use self custody, you know, for, for drip. Um, it, it's just, you know, I think it just needs to be, I think apps could do well to understand that they have two different types of users, some that are very new and some that are very advanced and give them different ways to use the application. Yeah, it, to me, it seems all about optionality, right? Like give the users the opportunity to self-custody their assets. That is, you know, what a lot of people in this industry today want. Uh, but I just like the angle that you're taking of, of giving people a, like an option B of this is complicated. We understand it's clunky. We'll do it for you. Uh, but here's the steps that if you want to do it on, on your own. I, I just love that angle. But I want to rewind a little bit to this mobile app you mentioned. Is this going to be available on like Apple, Android, and Solana phone, or what's your what's your release plan there? And if it's on Apple and Android, were there any challenges of getting into those stores? Well, so if you want to use the Drip app, um, it's going to be first available to people that have the Saka phone. So um, that's going to be our beta test group. Why? Those are the most committed, diehard Solana um, users out there. They're the best people to throw out, throw out the app and see what they kind of come back with. Um, plus the guy that's kind of leading mobile um, worked on the phone. So um, I know he's like very comfortable with the nuances of the operating system. Um, but yeah, it's going to be an iOS, Android. Uh, we haven't crossed the bridge yet. We have no reason to think that it's going to be a challenge though, because the app itself, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, it lives off chain. The front end lives off chain. Um, the only thing that really is on chain are the collectibles at the end of the day. Is that right? Because you, you now have these uh, concepts of droplets, right? Um, where you can actually purchase these things to maybe tip creators with and increase the probability of getting uh, different types of drops. Would that be done through the mobile app as well? Because if yep. so, that seems like they would want a cut of that. Yeah, they'll take a cut of it. Um, those are off-chain, so we're not selling you a token. Um, I mean, uh, droplets are most like other things in mobile games, right? Like they, We sell you packs. Uh, it's a virtual currency. Um yeah, I mean, you got to pay Apple. I mean, there's no avoiding it. Um, it's, it's terrible. I think we're still trying to figure out, are we uh, in, increasing the price for those for people that are on an iPhone? Or, um, you know, are we just swallowing the the hit? Um, it's pretty tough, though, because, like, ultimately, like, that, you know, 30% that you pay after a million dollars of sales, um, 
I mean, that's money coming straight out of the creator's pockets and our pockets in the day. It's that's brutal. It's really, really tough. So I think, you know, I mean, our hope is that like people fall in love with the experience. I think the app payments can be, um, you know, maybe even a loss leader for people discovering the utility of droplets. Um, and then when they're ready, they can pop into Phantom and pay with crypto or whatever and get them, you know, get a big discount. Seems like a decent path for me. So talking about mobile, uh, we had Dan Romero from Farcaster on a few weeks ago. And one of the things he said was, if you're building a consumer app, you have to do mobile. There's no getting around it. And Farcaster had a pretty big moment. I think it's kind of slowed down a bit, but they still have retained a good amount. Um, Which then brought up the conversation of, okay, what exactly is a user in crypto, right? Like Farcaster had these users, now they have slightly less. But then if people actually look at Drip's metrics, Drip actually has quite a few. I think something like 100K DAU. Um, and then I'll, I'll let you talk about the numbers. Uh, and so I tweeted about this, and then I was met with quite quite a bit of skepticism, let's say. Um, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, so first, I want you to um, maybe explain to people how you think about DAUs and MAUs, how do you measure it? What mechanisms do you use? And what are the known limitations? Yeah, it's a really complex question because, first of all, um, every app measures these things differently. Every chain measures like activity differently. Um, I don't think we really will ever have like a shared language for talking about these things. I mean, even if you look at like social media in the traditional sense and how they think about um users like there's a wide range of definitions that like public companies will use to talk about these things right i mean there was a um i don't remember like when twitter was acquired there was a whole thing around like you know whether like 95 i think there was like 95 percent of twitter's like actively reported monthly actives were not actually real there were bots and all that kind of stuff right so the same question that we're getting um about that is the same question that lives in Web two is the same question that everyone should be asking about any app in Web three. Um, in my opinion, like you know, when you are at the end of the day, like the reason we care about measuring DAUs is not because of some um, marketing thing; it's because we're trying to measure the health of um, of the company and how we're progressing. Um, and you know, I posted this thirty minute video where you can see that, like, ultimately DAUs are the kind of like one. Um, thing that dictates all the other activity in our app. So if DUs are growing, revenue is growing, and other things in, in Drip are growing. If those things get out of sync, then maybe DAU is not the right way to think about it. Um, and Drip makes this very difficult for people because, um, and it's difficult to stomach because, um, you know, there's like a lot of complexity around how the app actually works. And also we've been through, you know, a more than a year long fight against fraud, against bots, against people using multiple wallets to try to game the system. So, um, at various times in our history, like, you know, we are, um, you know, fighting back, but sometimes you're fighting back in arrears. So things that show up at one point may not be true in the future once we've done more work. Right. So, um, and that's true for today too. Right. When I look at our DAUs, um, you know, I can reasonably be confident that like we've gotten to, a good place today, but there's no reason why in um, two years, maybe we'll look back and like, Hey, it wasn't hundred K was 50 K. Right. I mean, I think, um, uh, when you're dealing with like wallets, which are de facto anonymous, you, you, ha- you have to have, um, a healthy measure of skepticism. Um, now like there's a couple levels here. So first of all, all the public data about drip is completely, um, misleading because, um, it, first of all, if you are a traditional analytics um, product looking at the Solana chain, Drips DAUs don't exist because the way that compressed NFTs work is that all the activity ends up in a single account. It doesn't get distributed across all the different wallets of users. Like when you look at um, you know, your phantom activity log and you see a compressed NFT getting minted to you, or you look at like Soul, um, I don't even know if Soul Scan supports compressed NFTs. If you look at um, like um, X-Ray by Helios, and you see like the log of compressed NFTs, what's actually happening is a simulation. Like you ha- and you're simulating in some fashion, like by looking through the uh, mer- these Merkle trees and finding activity and then aggregating it to your account. 
Um, I mean, it's not that dissimilar from how like regular NFTs work as well, but um, but like mints don't hit the account level. So people have said to me that, oh, when you look at the like, how come your DAUs are like higher than like Solana DAUs? Well, um, like that's probably going to be true forever because compressed NFTs. If you just look at, if you don't understand what's in these Merkle trees, um, none of those activities hit the chain. So they don't hit the chain in the way that these analytics sites measure them. Second of all, so the first thing is analytics. Non-chain analytics are pretty broken. Second of all, we um like in order to qualify for an airdropped NFT from Drip, um, you need to be a subscribed and b you need to have droplets on your account. And droplets can be earned uh, by logging in. That doesn't mean that someone um has logged in recently because if you come to Drip and you buy a hundred droplets and you sit on a single subscription on a creator uh, and they drop once a week, that means like in two years you're still going to get a drop from that creator. It doesn't mean that you logged in. So, um, when you look at the on-chain data, if you just look at like top ledger where drips, um, where drip maintains like, um, uh, kind of like some public data. Um, and by the way, even that set of data, we like have to work with top ledger to tell them these are the collections that we have. So like measure these, um, that's not in, something that you can just grab from the chain. You have to know kind of what you're looking for. Um, so in that case, like our, our like weekly receiving wallets is like a massive number. I mean, it's like, 500 to 600,000 uh, uh, every single week are receiving on-chain assets from us. But what you're looking at is like a slice of users for like 15 months that have have qualified, but maybe are not like showing up to the app and, or maybe haven't been seen for a long time, right? That's just kind of how how we kind of built the app. It, we didn't, we don't do that because we're trying to um, make ourselves look like we're a 600K weekly active um, user thing. It's just... Um, if you like, if you earn droplets or you bought them, um, the promise we make to you is that we're going to redeem those for collectibles and keep sending them to you. So can't look at the on-chain data. So what can you look at? Well, um, the first thing you could look at is people who are like signing into the app, right? That's, um, I would say like majority people out there probably would think of that as a DAU. And we certainly did too. But by the way, wallet sign-ins are not on-chain. I think this is not a well understood thing. Um, that's just the wallet talking to the website completely offline, by the way, <laughs> and just verifying, um, that, you know, Hey, this is the person that, um, that like, this is the wallet that we see that you should show, um, data for. Right. So, um, we, for a long time, we, we did measure just people verifying their pub keys. The thing is, um, blockchains are full of bots. They're full of people trying to, um, simulate activity in lots of different ways. And so, um, last year we had some days where there were like two or 300,000 wallet signs on drip. Now, um, you can sign in, you can do a, a pub key verification on drip without having an account because you can sign in and, and if you don't have an account with us, it will spit back like, Hey, you need an invite code to be able to join. Um, so even if we just publish sign in data, like that number is much higher. There are like thousands of people every single day who like try to log into the site with a wallet that does not have a valid account. So um, we discard all of that too, right? Then, um, you know, okay, well, we've said, okay, it's not people signing in. It's not on chain stuff. It's people that sign in that have an invite code on a daily basis. Um, but from there, we even put more qualifiers in because, um, these days, not so much, but back in the day, we had people who were fully automating drip. They were signing in with a wallet. Um, they were like clicking on navigation items. They were playing our daily game. They were doing all kinds of things like from a script, right? Now, like us uh, learning how to detect that and how to stop it is something that we spent hundreds of engineering hours on, maybe thousands of engineering hours on. Like that is, uh, that is something every app in, in crypto is, is having happen to them. Um, the question is like whether you care about that. And in our case, we do because, um, you know, those are people that are stealing from other users. Basically, we consider that financial fraud. So, um, I don't want to go into full details, but like, um, any, like there's a lot of effort to like try to understand this. Um, I've been, I've talked to experts from all over the world, um, like, um, uh, in this problem, not just from crypto. Like we've talked to the Gitcoin people who do this pretty well. But even like a um, couple weeks ago, we talked to the head of um, trust and security for Discord and you know, walked him through our entire like 
stack for detecting bots and detecting fraud. And, uh, and he was like, yeah, you guys basically do this state of the art way. The state of the art is that you are building, uh, you're looking at data, you're building heuristics of how users kind of behave on your site. Um, and you're looking for anomalies. You're looking for things that like, cause no matter what, the perfect bot doesn't look like a human exactly. Figuring out how they don't look like a human, it's, it takes a lot of, <laughs> a lot of effort, a lot of manual review, right? Um, so we literally every single day we go through numbers, all kinds of charts and just look, is there something happening that doesn't like, is just kind of out of band with other things? Um, and without question, whenever there's like, um, inhuman behavior, it does show up. You write a fraud rule, you ban those users and you make sure that anyone that does, does that again gets banned in the future. Nowadays, what, what like the, the best companies in the world do, which we'd also do, you take all that heuristic data, all the fraud rules, and you train a model and you say, here's all the users that um, got banned over time. And here's all the users that you didn't ban over time. And you score every single person. And um, now you can kind of separate, okay, like, and, and not only, and it's, a, and it's not a linear thing, right? It's like, okay, these are users that are kind of behaving more like bots and these are users that are behaving more like humans. And these are two separate things. Um, and you can start to get kind of truth on like, okay, what do you consider a real person logging and using the service as intended, who is economic and productive and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we've kind of done that all. So when, when I think about a DAU now, um, I have two buckets. I have a bucket, which is the total number of people who like came to the site, signed in, um, you know, have page views, have all these like front end characteristics, um, and then there's, and so that's, that's one number. That's a larger number. And then there's another model, which is, okay, let's, let's take that same data set and let's run every single DAU through an ML model. Let's score them. And then let's set a threshold and say, okay, anyone that's above a certain spam score, let's exclude them because they're not economic for us. And let's take everyone that's under that. That doesn't mean that those people aren't real. Sometimes there's people just doing weird things. So like when you have this many users, you're going to see edge cases um, all, all, all over the place, right? You're going to have people that are doing all kinds of crazy things with your app. Um, there, when I sent that data to Mert, um, I think I, uh, that he published on the internet, I think I tried to like, um, uh, you know, explain that like in both contexts, in both the, the model where we redact out um, pe- people or things that we don't consider to be human or productive, and we look at the raw data, both of those things were showing us as having crossed the 100K threshold. Now, the Delta today, just to give you a sense of what that is, like yesterday, I just looked for the show, there were around 137, 140,000 DAUs on the app. When I look at our bot model, we say there's like between 110 and 115,000 this weekend per day of like people that pass that threshold. Um, I currently believe, and I say currently because in the future, it may change our mind with new th- things that we discover that even that 140 is probably mostly humans. It's very, very difficult to build a bot that um, runs drip today. You can try it yourself. You can see how we've engineered this thing. It's like this like drips, the engineering we've done to uh, like, even to try to run a basic thing on drip is almost impossible. The level of uh, engineering credibility you have to have to like pass a single request through our front end is crazy. You have to pass CloudFront. You have to pass, you have to like understand how sockets work. Um, there's like all kinds of things that go into that. Plus you have to deal with our rate limits. You have to deal with, um, uh, that are on IP, that are on user agent, that are on all these things. Like but there's like, these are not simple things to talk about with the public. So when I say DAU, it's like, there's like a whole pyramid of tech and engineering and research that kind of under, underlies all that. Um, and if I ever feel like, um, like it's, I'm worried about it then just have to go check the revenue because at the end of the day, like, I don't care how many, you know, you can say DAU is boss or whatever. Like ultimately, like there's no boss spending money on drip and like people, lots of people every day, thousands of people are spending money on drip. And, you know, that's kind of where I underlie the comfort that like, okay, there's a sizable user base. They're spending money. They're doing everything we want them to do. Uh, like, you know, you can't really argue that they are not productive people, right? They're not productive to to what we're trying to do. So that was a long, sorry, that was a really long explanation. But, um, but like these are not simple. They're not. There's no simple answer for this. I can go on Twitter and like post a single thing, 
simple thing, right? And and Mert was like, you know, hey, you make these things too complicated for people. But like, you can't talk about engineering concepts um, and dumb it down when people are actively trying to like try trying to undermine something that they don't understand. You know what I mean? Like, you have to give them like the the reality, which is it's complicated. Wow, that was like ten minutes, but yeah. <laughs> That was perfect. That was much needed, honestly. Yeah, and uh, so while we're on the on the while we have some momentum going uh, in the dispelling uh, misconceptions about Drip, let's say, I think maybe in the similar tweet that I posted, one kind of answer was like, "Who are these users?" Like, I I use Solana. I don't know a hundred thousand people that use it, so therefore, where are they? Yeah, and you had an answer for this. <laughs> um so first that is the first question i want to ask yeah. uh and second is the revenue piece right because when you first came out with this idea people were like oh how's this guy gonna make money oh good job you're giving people free nfts haha <laughs> but then it's like okay now you do actually make money so yeah. curious if you can talk about how the revenue model works as well after yeah um i want to add an addendum which is on the data side um it's very uh so we do a lot of data science to dr- drive these numbers. You got to take this in context because I don't think there are many other apps or companies that are kind of agreeing upon this kind of framework, right? So when you when you look at this, this when, when, I, when I post this data, it's like it's also in the context of a lot of other crypto apps and companies who treat this completely differently. And and you know you like you can go and press them and ask them the same questions like how do you come up with this? And you need to compare them on the merit of those things together. All right. Um, you asked me about money, but I can't remember the first thing you asked me because I was uh, trying to think about this uh, relevance here. Yeah, it was a question related to where the users are coming. Ah, so I- yeah. So, um, I mean, we have a huge s- slice of Solana. So, first of all, like um, saying that um, that um, you don't know who these people are. I mean, that's like you know, there's only a few thousand people that even. Um, that that like show up on crypto Twitter, like you say, the see the same people over and over again. I promise, come look at the drip DMs. Come look at um, the things that are happening privately. These are people that like they're not influencers. They're not people trying to dump on your head. They're not people trying to shill an NFT or a token, right? They're just using the chain, enjoying the content, vibing with our creators. Um, they're not like they're not going to be the most visible participants in the ecosystem, which like largely don't really understand or or appreciate our model, and that's okay. Um, Second of all, we're f- recruiting people every day by the hundreds or thousands from other chains. So we have people, both collectors and creators, coming from all kinds of L1s. They're being disenfranchised from Tezos, from Cardano, from Algorand. Um, like we are winning people from I chains you've never heard of. Um, <laughs> maybe Mert's heard of them, but um, they are like coming to Drip because the experience that they get on Drip just it's just different, and they feel it right. Um, I, I can, yesterday I saw one of our creators again from another chain. I'm not going to call them out because, or, or even the chain, because it'll be too obvious who it is. Um, but yeah, he was in a chat with other people from his community talking about drip and they were saying, Hey, why aren't you like, um, putting work over here on this other marketplace on our chain? And he was just like, he's like, look, I love the chain. It's just like, I'm like, um, to be honest though, like on Solana, I'm sending out thousands of NFTs and it's free. Um, and I'm really enjoying that experience. Right. And, and he's sharing that and these people are onboarding and they're coming to drip as their first step. So, um, like you're getting dot East in there too. Like these are like, it is a mass audience. It is not the 1% of people who are out there trying to get you to, to trying to influence you, um, in some way or another. Um, I think the NFT space in particular, I mean, uh, this is a, a remarkable thing, but, um, I would say that like, Half of our users don't even know how to trade the NFTs that they get from Drip. That's how new they are to Solana and to the ecosystem. Because I wake up and I look at the DMs on the account and they're saying, Hey, I don't know how to trade these. I know someone told me I can trade them. I don't even know where to go. <laughs> right. Um, let alone like more complex products, right? Like this, the question, um, the original person that's, um, you're talking about merge who was saying, I don't know where they are, um, was the guy that runs an NFT lending marketplace. I have to tell you. The pool of people who want to lend or borrow with NFTs is like the top 1,000 users of, of the blockchain and like NFTs. It's not the other 99.9% you know, of people. So um, if you can't see them, that's because your product isn't like, like can't use these users yet, right? But 
I do have good news for those builders, which is that you will start to see them in the field and pretty soon. Because I'm watching them grow their understanding of Solana, grow their understanding of collectibles and appreciation for NFTs in general, um, and start looking for like other types of things they can do. So um, I promise you, if, what you're seeing, if you don't feel them today, just wait a year, they're, they're going to be there. Like they're, um, they're getting as addicted to this stuff as all, all of us did maybe a couple of years ago. Um, it just takes some time for them to like care about these more advanced um, products. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I, I want to keep going on the user conversation. So I hate to ask you like a semi tangential question, but you just mentioned, um, you know, the NF, the creators are sending these compressed NFTs out for free to thousands of people. Does Drip, uh, obviously the cost to do the, to mint thousands of NFTs on Solana are, is quite low, but does Drip uh, like kind of finance those transactions on behalf of the creators? Yeah, let me answer that and also address the revenue point that Mert made before and kind of in one thing. So um, we are spending thousands of dollars a week um, minting NFTs, um, but it's, I mean, relative to the scale that we're putting out there, which is like four or five, six million NFTs a week, um, I mean, it, it's nothing, right, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, Drip funds everything that happens in the app. So for creators, it's totally free. For, for users, it's free um, unless they want to support creators with donations and things like that. Um, and our, like our revenue model is kind of like threefold. It's, um, it's very simple. If you look at the app, um, the smallest pool of revenue for us is royalties. We have a one and a half percent, um, royalty share on every single of the 120 million collectibles that we sent out. Um, but it's tiny. I mean, these are things we're paying for like pennies. Like we're picking up every day, like, I don't know, like 20,000, like one, one thousandth of a penny royalties or something like that, you know, like it's not even worth accounting for. Um, Second, um, and you know, growing product is sponsor collectibles. So we have this like format where you can claim a collectible on the top of the drip vault and brands are paying 10, 15, $20,000 a week, um, to kind of be featured there. It's like a fire hose, like, like putting your products on that stream, you're going to get in front of, um, you know, at least a couple hundred thousand people in that week while you're there and you are going to pick up users and sales and uh, all kinds of other things from that. Um, that we take 70% of the revenue. And we give 30% back to creators. Um, most of the revenue today though comes from selling droplets. So um, droplets are how you receive collectibles in Drip and how you give back. So um, in order to receive a collectible, every collectible you receive, you spend one droplet to receive it. So if you're subscribed to 100 creators on Drip, I mean, you send you one thing per week. Um, you're spending 100 droplets per week. How do you get droplets? You can earn up to 10 um, for free every six hours just by clicking a button. Or you can go and buy packs that are about one cent per droplet. And it scales from a dollar all the way up to um, $5,000 if you want, if you're a much bigger donor. On that model, we give 70% of the revenue from that to creators and we keep 30% of that as a margin. So, um, and this stuff adds, is adding up. Like I I'm, I think we're all, um, you know, like, su- like a little bit surprised by um, the immense energy that people have. I mean, there's there's a droplet sale there's more than one droplet sale per minute. Um, and there has been for like three months in a row. Um, and, you know, I mean, this is awesome for creators because they're eating and they're doing really well with us. Um, but for us too, it's like, um, it's changing our, our our minds about the other kinds of things we can build. Like once you start to see um, revenue showing up, you can start to model things like, you know, ARPU and other like traditional metrics. Uh, and Drip kind of functions more like a Web2 app in that respect. Like we're not trying to make $1,000 from one person. Um, we, we'd be happy to make a thousand dollars from 10,000 people per month. Uh, and this is why DAUs are so important to me too, because we know, um, we know that DAU is turning to revenue at this point. Um, we know that, uh, like people who fall in love with the product, like they grow their spend over time. Um, so our mission at the moment is just like find new ways to grow and find high quality users and bring them in, um, and get them started for free and then, um, let them kind of like fire their way into becoming like a higher quality retained user. All right. So what I want to do now is I think we've cleared up a good amount of misconceptions about Drip. I want to completely shift and focus on the Coliseum Hackathon. And the angle I want to take with this is, Veb, you published a post. Actually, you were a VC before, uh, or, or at least you invested in venture. I forget the exact what, what you did, but you, you know how to raise money. And more importantly, or maybe not more importantly, but certainly quite importantly, you uh, uh, published this tweet thread about how to raise money, how to how to pitch your company, how to write a pitch deck, how to present what you do, okay? 
And uh, actually, when I last uh, raised money, uh, and I raised money three times now in venture, I actually used uh, what, what you said, and it was actually quite useful. And um, so now what's going to happen is uh, people from Coliseum, uh, who, which is the new Salon Hackathon, uh, which got slash accelerator, um, I, I get pitched all these ideas from them, and generally the pitches are quite, um, let's say they need work. Uh, they're raw. And uh, maybe we need to transform them into a bit more uh, uh, well-polished stories. So uh, can you just, you know, maybe kind of go over that thread as much as you remember and just talk about some general tips or advice you would have for these folks looking to pitch their companies and pitch decks? Wow, thank you for previewing this question for me so I could prepare for it. Um, uh, You absolutely did not do that. All right, so... um, so, I mean, if you ask like 10 entrepreneurs, you'll get 10 different answers on this. Um, you don't have to take my word for it, but I raised nine figures of venture capital and um, I think I'm pretty good at them. I also like Moonlight as a VC, so I've seen a lot of hundreds and hundreds of pitches. Um, I'd say like the biggest uh, mistake that most founders make um, is that they spend way too much energy talking about what their product is and not enough about what they're going to become when they're at scale. Like VCs, don't invest for today. They could care less about the fucking purchase button, you know, um, analytics that you have or whatever. Like they, they want to understand how you're going to compete at scale with whatever incumbents, um, or whatever problems that you're kind of solving. So, you know, when I think about building a deck, um, I'm kind of building it from like the vision backwards, right? Like the vision is to like the implementation of drip in the seed round was very hard to believe in, to be honest, because um, the product experience while well, you sign up for a list and we send you free NFTs, right? It was like really boring. Um, but the vision was that, um, NFTs were a vessel, vessel for direct to consumer content. Um, that was kind of like a relationship between a creator and, um, and then an user. And so like I actually published my seed deck for drip in response to some FUD that are my, that in my deck, I said we were selling user data, which we don't do. Um, so you can see it on my Twitter profile somewhere if you want. But yeah, it really does like it starts from like walking backwards from that. Um, you know, um, hey, look, Helios isn't um it's not about RPC, right? Helios is about uh is knowing that like many amazing applications are gonna be built on the on the blockchain and it's too hard to build those. Um and you kind of uh, that's the vision, right? It's about building great applications, it's not about providing like APIs, right? That's how you do it, it's not what you're really doing. Um so I think that kind of, that kind of like philosophy, I apply at like every micro level in a deck. When I think about like, um, you know, describing revenue, when you're a really early stage company, um, you don't have good metrics. Like your metrics are trash, to be honest with you. You don't have any customers. You don't have anyone using your service. Um, so like, how do you start to build a conviction in an investor that like, we're actually going to do the thing that we're saying? And I think everything in a pitch comes down to that. Like, how can I b- make you believe that? I'm going to do with things I said I'm going to do. Um, so, you know, there are lots of, um, different, there are lots of like kind of tricks here, but like, um, to me, like on the revenue side, as an example, um, it's about pipeline, right? I want to know, um, have you actually done the work of go- going out and talking to like the best candidates and where are they in your pipeline? And sometimes like a single discussion, um, doesn't feel like very important, but that's still a line item that you're putting in your deck. You're showing a VC that I'm working from, I'm working backwards from the fact that we're going to have customers and here's where we are in that plan. Okay. Yeah. I'm in step one of a 10 step plan, but this is what we're doing, you know, and this is where I am. Um, you can apply that for, um, for like user growth as well. Um, I, I think, um, one of the things I talk about a lot about is like expectation setting. So there's a huge world of difference from saying to somebody, um, that, uh, hey, our plan was to go out and, and like acquire a hundred users for a product. And instead, 400 of them came. That's one statement. In that case, we have 400 users that came to the platform. It's not other thing to say that, um, Hey, we had a plan to um, get 500 um, users and we got 400. <laughs> like the facts are the same, but the framing is totally different and makes the person on the other side feel very differently about how you're approaching this thing. So I think, um, setting expectations and constantly busting through those is like, not only a skill for like for 
pitching and for being a compelling storyteller. It's also a skill that you take all the way to the public markets as a founder. And that's what the best companies and founders in the world do. They're constantly setting expectations and then busting through them. So like, that's about like, you know, understanding, um, you know, and, and, and setting up kind of narrative that, um, you know, is like, you know, not going to get you all the way there. Um, I think in crypto specifically, you have so many other fundraising tools that are available that are in, in, in web two. Um, and you should not be afraid to explore them. There's like, I don't know. I've met, I, like probably like you, like there are like some angel investors in our ecosystem who are worth nine figures plus, especially right now. Um, or maybe they just made a huge bag with whiff or bonk or whatever. Um, and these people are act- out there actively investing. Like they're, they're writing like 50, 100, $250,000 checks. So I think, um, diversifying your funding strategy is not all about getting VCs. Like there are plenty of rich people who are looking to put their money to work. Um, so being like, you know, resourceful about that, I think is pretty important. I don't know. There's a million other things that go into, but that's, those are some of the things that came to mind. And, uh, if, if you are listening, I, I also angel invest. So, uh, let me know if you, if you have a good idea. Um, I do too. But- yeah. For, I gave you $2,500 and I think you gave us $2,500. So we're, we're bonded in blood. <laughs> Yes. Um, okay. So the other part of this is before you get to that point, let's say you have, uh, I, I, like, I think one of the important parts is um, you can, you know, you employ some tactics to present your idea and make a good pitch. But I mean, ultimately, your idea has to be something worth pitching. Uh, and then most of the time, it's not. Like, sure. my, my first, like, five startup ideas were just awful. Or mm, they, 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 they just didn't work. <laughs> Um, and, uh, so, okay. One of the questions I get like pretty much every day is somebody wants to build something on Solana. They don't know what to build. They want an idea. They want help. And I always say, please just make like a mirror.xyz with, with just support Solana so I can use it. So I'm selfish. I'm curious. What do you, uh, do you have any advice for these people who would like to generate startup ideas? Yeah. You're not ready. You're not ready because I think it's really hard to just like sit down at your desk and like generate a good idea. Um, like the, the things that win are the things you just get pulled into because you had a problem or you're trying to solve something or you're annoyed by something. Um, like I, I really, I, I don't know. I've never seen someone just like, you know, it's, it's like learning how to swim from a book. Like you gotta be in it already kind of like feeling that really deeply. Um, otherwise, like, honestly, you, even if you get to that through those initial steps, like if you don't have that deep meaning in, inside in some fashion, um, it's really hard to kind of know where to take things. So I, I, I would just say like, if that's you, maybe just take a breather. Like you don't have to participate in this hackathon. Like, but the best thing you can do is just go use a bunch of stuff on chain that excites you and then figure out what you don't like about it, you know, um, and then make it better. Like that's, that's that's kind of where I would start. But I, but like, yeah, don't try to start a company. I think that's a, did you try to start Helios or Helium or whatever you you work on? (laughs) No, I did not. I was quite annoyed. I was already building a lot of random stuff on Solana myself, like bots and tools. And then I was like, wait a minute, this kind of sucks. (laughs) And so we need better tools here. That's why this podcast is this too, right? Because you went out there looking for like podcasts about Solana. There was nothing good. You're like, I'm going to do it myself. Uh, that's the genesis of all good ideas. It's not a paper thing. It's it's a heart thing, honestly. All right. Well, I think that's a good way to cap it on my end. Dan, unless you have any final questions. No, I, I love that piece. Just getting uh, to listen to you two jam on, on all those ideas. That was fantastic. And and Vibu, thanks a ton for joining us. This was a great conversation today. Uh, really loved the the long-winded answer there on, on how you think about users. I think that's really important context for... Uh, everybody in this industry, especially those building consumer apps, just to think about it. It doesn't, it isn't something that gets talked about often enough. So thank you. Uh, pleasure to have you back on the podcast and I'm sure we'll do it again sometime. Cheers.